It is the summer of 2021. There's been political turmoil both in the Kaliningrad region of Russia and the neighboring Baltic states. Accusations of supporting unrest as well as border violations fly left and right. Before you know it, there is fighting involved. And suddenly a Russian military force swoops towards Kaliningrad, encroaching on all three Baltic states in the process. While this idea is pretty wild, this video gets even wilder. Imagine all that happens in a political situation where the EU is on its own. US and UK forces are not present anywhere near the Baltic countries, and they're keeping to themselves for the time being. Through this setup we will find out if the EU alone would be able to muster enough force to do anything. Could it free the Baltic states? Watch to find out. Let me just say that as a gamer I found World of Warships to satisfy that need to control big ships and pummel my opponents with big guns. Yes, this video is sponsored by World of Warships Legends, but now they've added aircraft carriers. Finally! Legends is custom designed for PlayStation and Xbox and is free to play. With the April update, World of Warships Legends also celebrates its first two years. Expect festive content, activities and big sales. But let me get back to the carriers. US and Japanese fleets get them, three each. As much as I like big guns getting to maneuver my air squadrons around and sink some battleships with torpedoes and bombs is even better. I'm a sucker for air power. Matches get real exciting now as the carriers give you new options to win scenarios. Playing as carriers you're basically at two places at once, so dedicated commanders have been added to the game, helping you establish command. If you want to give World of Warships Legends a try, look for it on PlayStation or Microsoft Store, or simply click the link below. Try it out! Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia are on their own pretty weak militarily. They are small and can't afford to keep a big army. Altogether, the three have some 30,000 army and joint staff personnel combined, with another 35,000 marked as reservists. Those are not maneuver unit troop totals though but total personnel including various support units, military academy and command staff. Also, their reservists lack proper training, as most are to have 20 to 60 days of training within a time period of 5 to 10 years. Barely enough to maintain even the most basic competency. Altogether, the trio possesses a little under 600 various armored personnel carriers and infantry fighting vehicles, and a token artillery force of some 140 pieces. Seven transport helicopters and three light transport planes between them would not likely make much difference, due to the small geographical depth of all three countries. And the two mid-range SAM batteries would be almost useless against the Russian force. Are the aforementioned forces reinforced by EU's units? Yes. Here's a rough list. Ten Eurofighters, courtesy of Germany and Italy. Some ten armored infantry companies worth of troops. A tank company a small engineer and electronic warfare unit and two mortar platoons. All those coming from various EU countries at the moment. But all those are still a token force, numbering a little over 2000 army personnel. Of course, on the other side of the boxing ring, the Russian military, however large it is, is not all positioned near the Baltic. Indeed, just taking troops near the Ukraine and moving them up north would take some time, as the distance isn't exactly small, not to mention the Far East units, which would have to cross the entirety of Russia. But even when tallying up just the nearby forces, Russia looks much more capable. In its Western Military District and Northern Fleet Command District it has some 18 brigades worth of troops, plus 6 Airborne and Special Forces brigades, which are of smaller size. That's likely over 80,000 troops in maneuver units. Most of those units are positioned fairly close to Russian western borders and would not take too long to go into the Baltics, once the order is given. Perhaps mere days as battle plans are put in action. Facing them would be some 5 or so brigades worth of units in the three Baltic states that would be ready to react. Further units would require either mobilization of Baltic countries reservists or additional EU units being brought in. But quickly bringing in units would be unlikely as air routes would probably be closed down. The Russian Air Force would immediately start operating in the area. 
the Russian Northern Fleet, Baltic Fleet and 6th Air Army units are all in the range of the Baltic area, operating some 250 tactical combat planes. Those would quickly find themselves under pressure by the EU Air Forces, also operating from their initial bases. Of course, the EU Air Force would also be dispersed. It would not initially have all of its assets in position to perform missions over the Baltics. France, Spain, Greece and Italy would likely need to first relocate their fleets into other EU countries, closer to the fighting. Russia would use that time to do the same, relocating their air forces from all around the country to help with the fighting. Still, it's likely that if the EU can come up with a quick, unified battle plan, it would be able to outnumber the Russians in the air by a large margin. The EU would have some issues though. On average, it would be flying over bigger distances, making their planes less available on the battlefield. And EU planes would be facing not just the Russian air forces, but also ample Russian surface-to-air missile systems. Again, a large number is already fairly close. Further systems would be moving westward over time, augmenting the army SAMs deployed within the maneuver units. The EU would likely be able to suppress the Russian Air Force through numbers and some technological edge, but it would struggle to put that advantage to use when it comes to ground strikes, both due to air defenses and the fact that the EU's air forces are simply not prepared for mass bombing campaigns. Most of the individual countries have hundreds of guided bombs in their inventories, with only the bigger ones having thousands. The initial action would likely come from several sides. Besides the big Russian push through Latvia and a smaller one going into Estonia, Russia would likely try to reinforce their Kaliningrad region as quickly as possible. This video can't speculate on politics, but in short, the cooperation of Belarus would be very important for that. While Belarus may seek to shy away from a war, the EU would still likely perceive it as an enemy if it allowed Russia to go through its territory and reinforce Kaliningrad. Of course, even if Belarus would miraculously stand up to Russia, it's likely some Russian transport planes would reach Kaliningrad before EU air forces shut down that airspace. To even get to the Baltics, going through Kaliningrad would be a must for the EU. And to upkeep maximum pressure the moment the EU does decide to try and take back the Baltics, Kaliningrad would likely get attacked by Polish forces. Of course, for that to happen, there would have to be all sorts of German, French, Italian and other countries' troops on the way as well. Poland or any other country would not dare to risk it against Russia alone. Poland is by far closest and could react quickest. And its army is fairly potent. Its 15 brigade strong military could put Kaliningrad under immense pressure. Russia would thus rush through the Baltics via a narrow corridor, not wasting time to fully occupy them initially. The Polish army, coupled with the forces in the three Baltic states, could roughly rival the initial Russian forces. While Poland and the EU do have the option of not touching Russian territory and using the narrow Polish-Lithuanian border to access the Baltic countries, it's not realistic that the EU would be so considerate. It wouldn't really matter politically if the EU would be attacking Russian forces in the occupied Baltics or Russian forces in the sovereign Russian territory of Kaliningrad. Plus, attacking through such a narrow choke point would play into the Russian hand. Indeed, the EU would be best served by opening the widest possible front against Russia and going through the shortest route. Which is why Poland would likely take the brunt of Russian punishment via ballistic and cruise missile attacks, trying to disperse and slow down the Poles. But assembling a larger force would be quite hard and slow for the EU. A plan of reaction would need to be agreed upon. Right now, France and Germany can't agree over a joint fighter program, and Italy and Sweden decided to join a separate British one. The EU was deeply divided when it came to the loans to Greece, or handling of the immigrants from the Middle East. No one can really tell how long a proper response force would take to assemble, or even when exactly would the first Polish-led strike happen. Once more forces do assemble and deploy closer to the battlefield, both sides would get to use most of their air forces. So most of the 1000 tactical combat jets and 137 bombers for Russia and most of the 1600 combat jets for the EU. A little slower to arrive due to mostly road and rail transport would be the added Russian air defenses. 
But even if half of the total tally could be present near the battlefield, the EU force would continue to have a hard time over the Baltic region. They would negate that airspace to Russia, but would not be able to control it enough to perform mass ground strikes. The EU's SAM systems would not see much action, as Russia would most likely be unwilling to undergo airstrike campaigns outside the Baltic area. The brunt of the fire support for the Russian forces would come in the form of artillery and their tank units. But before those can amass in numbers, both sides would fly in their lighter units. Airborne and air assault units would add a few tens of thousands of troops to both sides within a few weeks. The EU would be adding their entire airborne and air assault force, while the Russians would be bringing in the remainder of their force. Pinkov's assessment is that over half of the 45,000 strong Russian airborne force would already be used in the very initial stages of the Russian campaign. Once the artillery and tanks do come in in big numbers, there would be carnage. Considering the battlefield itself wouldn't be that big. Most of the Baltic states would likely fall within weeks, without too much destruction. But it's the southern Lithuania, Kaliningrad and northeast Poland that would see most of the fighting. While the EU does have more tanks and other hardware, it's unlikely that all that equipment could or would be sent to battle, especially for the not always unified EU. Just how many of the EU countries would participate and in what capacity is debatable and some that do wish to participate might take a long time to set up their big armies close by, especially countries whose armed forces weren't designed to operate a long way from home for prolonged periods. In theory, the EU, if acting in the best interest of a single EU entity, could be well served by opening many fronts, like Finland and Sweden attacking the Russian north and trying to push towards St. Petersburg. Such a move would tie up a lot of Russian forces. On the other hand, by not doing that, those Scandinavian armies would either sit idly or would be forced to go around, via sea, losing months in inefficient transit. Whether Finland and Sweden could be talked into such a move, which would clearly be just a ruse and not a permanent military goal, is again debatable. It's very likely Ukraine would flare up. With Russia distracted, Ukraine might very well try their chances and take back parts of their country possibly even backed by openly present EU forces. Which might in that way again broaden the front efficiently, without traveling too far. But all that goes way beyond the scope of this video. It does show however that in the real world, any move on the Baltics might very easily spread into a much bigger war. And that it would also be impossible for the US or UK, which do have forces all around Europe, to remain neutral. Europe does have way more ground troops overall, but again just how many would participate is another matter. But even if just half of the European numbers get used, Russia would likely be locally outnumbered in the Baltics, as it would have to protect other areas and would not be able to place its entire might just around the Baltic battlefield. The reservist formations would also tilt the balance of power to the EU side. While Russia has very little structured reserve formations that actually do get to train, many European countries do have periodical training programs, especially the northern countries. European reservists are mostly equipped with light weapon systems, not great for offensive ops or fast maneuvers. Russian reservists might be better equipped. Russia holds some 15 brigades worth of ex-Soviet heavy equipment stored and maintained and possibly some of the non-preserved ex-Soviet systems might still be reusable. The EU has mostly sold off their surplus equipment. The Russian National Guard is also a military formation that might be more useful than the closest equivalent EU formations, which include federal police. The Russian National Guard is equipped with military-grade vehicles. Now, such forces would not get used on a mass scale. But since Russia would be defending, be it in other regions or defending the taken Baltic states area, it could at least somewhat rely on such paramilitary units for defense. The EU using its paramilitary for offensive operations would be basically impossible. The political inertia and issues of agreement between 27 EU states would very likely lead to Russia occupying all three Baltic states before the EU manages to push back. And even then, the exact success of the EU's counteroffensive 
would be dependent on its unity. It could very well take back all three states. But that would require months if not a year of war with high casualties. All that enabled only by near total unity. In the more realistic scenario of only some EU countries going all in to help, it's likely the EU would stop after taking the Russian Kaliningrad exclave as well as liberating southern Lithuania. The exposed Kaliningrad is precisely what might dissuade Russia from going after the Baltic states, as such a move would likely end up in a trade, losing some territory to gain some other territory. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.